Welcome. This is presentation number five in our series, Rereading the Fourth Gospel, and the story of Jesus the Revealer. And the title of today's presentation is The First Sign. We're going to attend a wedding. And I <coughs> have usually worn very boring clothes, <coughs> but those of you who are can see will see that I have a pink shirt on today. <coughs> it's just barely showing, but I thought I would put on a more cheerful, uh, a, a more cheerful clothes for the occasion. I could have dressed up more. <coughs> it is an amazing story, and dressing up for it would not be a bad idea. <coughs> so the wedding in Cana, that's the first sign. And we read that, that on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And this scene is a favorite of artists and of iconic people who make icons in the Orthodox tradition. So. There are lots and lots of icons depicting this scene with Jesus and the mother. And here, prominent, the bride and the groom, more prominent than they are in the story. And of course, the jars and the <coughs> anticipating what will happen, water made into wine. So that's, the, that's it. But we need to do some preliminaries and <coughs> they will do deal with time and place. So here on the third the day, so <coughs> the narrator, the uh, gospel is keeping us abreast on timing as well, on, as well as on uh, location. So if we look then <coughs> at the timing, we will see that this is a week to remember. On day one, we have an encounter between John the Baptist and <coughs> the Jerusalem emissaries. That's how it starts. So John the Baptist is the first uh, part. And then <coughs> we have <coughs> the next day, that's day two, John the Baptist, he proclaims, he announces that he sees the Lamb, uh, <coughs> the Lamb of God here. And then on day Three, the next day, the, uh, Jesus appears again, and two disciples of John will follow Jesus and will become the first disciples of Jesus. Uh, that's how we, we've done that. And then on day four, the next day, <coughs> Jesus decides to go to Galilee. And <coughs> on day six, that's the third day, reckoned in relation to day number four. So just to get that uh, straight, <coughs> I am quoting from Ernst Henschen with his uh, uh, massive John commentary, uh, <coughs> one of the most prestigious commentaries. On the third day, <coughs> reckoned from the scene featuring Nathaniel in chapter one, because Jesus was still in the region of the Jordan in the previous scene, the phrase on the next day used hitherto would not be satisfactory. <coughs> so we have time, very precise timing here. All of these things are happening within one week, including <coughs> his attendance at the wedding in Cana. <coughs> Let's do place. So on days one to three, all of those things that I mentioned already, John the Baptist, pointing out the Lamb of God, the two disciples encounter. All of this took place in Bethany across the Jordan. So that's where we begin the story in John. On day four, he decides to go to Galilee. On day six, he is attending the wedding in Cana. That's how it is <coughs> in, in John. And then we have it on the map. It isn't fully settled in scholarly opinions exactly where the Bethany is. There is still some uh, discussion about it. It could be further north, that's true. But this is one, one, lo uh, one location that is favored by many. <coughs> so let's circle it. 
the location here is favored by many, <coughs> not very far from Jerusalem. So those emissaries who came from Jerusalem, that would be a plausible distance for them to, to do that. And then <coughs> Jesus on day four will decide to go to Galilee. Here is Galilee. And here is the location where some of the disciples, they came from Bethsaida. We were told about that in the previous chapter. And here is Cana. And these are real places. Here, by the way, is Nazareth. So it's not far from the place where Jesus in the Gospels grew up. So those are the <coughs> spatial or location parameters. So we have Jesus placed in space and time here very precisely in the fourth gospel and far more detailed than what you have in the synoptics. <coughs> okay, here we are at the wedding. The supply of wine having run out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Let's look at this. So, sure, this iconic representation highlights that interaction between Jesus and the mother very appropriately, very much reflecting a concern in the text. And Jesus said to her, woman, what is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <coughs> Let's look at a couple of questions. I have made as a headline ambushed by lack that the depletion of the supply of wine was not anticipated. This is not how you do weddings in the Middle East. You should not be running out of wine. But here we are. So there is an ambush in the story, the ambu and we're ambushed by lack, by a deficiency. No wine. Is the problem trivial or serious? And here in Greek, TMOI kai soi, that's what, what Jesus will answer Mary when she says, I have no wine. He will say, TMOI kai soi. It's very curt in Greek. Is the answer polite or rude? Is that a way to talk, to answer? That's the other uh, issue. And then inside this answer, is the answer a yes or a no? Does he seem to say yes, we will do something about it? And then let's look at some options here, trivial or serious. <coughs> there is an old Jewish saying, as old as the time we are looking at here, without wine, there is no joy. So the association on that criterion would be somewhat serious, <coughs> although I suppose it is possible to live life without joy. But <coughs> it would be better if there were joy too. That would be a better life. So <coughs> this flags the problem as somewhat serious. And then <coughs> there is Craig Keener in his commentary saying, and something I think we can sort of feel intuitively. What is more certain is that the groom was facing a potential social stigma that could make him the town, the talk of his guests for years to come. We enter this wedding, they ran out of wine. You know, it's never happened before. <coughs> and I have some experience firsthand with Middle Eastern hospitality in our time. And it's always abundant. There is always abundant provisions. You simply do not run out of provisions, even if you have many guests. And here you could assume that my, ah, that some more guests came than we had planned. Jesus comes with all those 12 disciples or however many they were at that time. <coughs> As to the question, <coughs> the question <coughs> here that Jesus or his answer to Mary, is it polite or rude? Well, most commentators think there is, it is quite rude, that this is a kind of distancing of Jesus in relation to, <coughs> to Mary and her, and her request or her implicit request, because she just tells him they have no wine. But there is an expectation in that report to her. <coughs> so here again with Craig Keener, what does he say? He says, 
that she approached him not as her son, but as a miracle worker. He replies not as her son, but as her Lord. I, I'm not totally sure that that is correct. I am quite sure that there is distancing in the words used by Jesus. There is distancing. But how about body language? How about tone of voice? How about facial expression? How about a wink with the eye? Some other thing, some other communication than that. So <coughs> that's Kiener's <coughs> uh, uh, interpretation that it was not discounted. <coughs> but let's do the, the, the third one. <coughs> is the answer is the answer a yes or a no? <laughs> Clearly his answer is yes, even though his words might lead, uh, lead us to think it was no. I don't care about that. In Norwegian we have, a t uh, we have an expression, det er ikke mitt bord. <coughs> that is not my table. That's, you know, so that is not a concern of mine. That's, you know, what you might hear him say. But he isn't saying no. He is saying yes. Probably by means of his body language. And body language is not in the text. Body language must be inferred. That is what good readers will have to do to texts like these that are so sparing. <clears throat> and then there is a looking ahead in the text. My hour has not yet come. Down the road, the hour will come. What will it be? And here we know that there is awareness of the hour from the beginning. It, it is as though we are already being sensitized to a script in this uh, book. And it's there from the beginning. And Joanne Brandt, who has written the John Commentary and the Paideia New Testament uh, Commentary series, where, i say it again, I have written the Revelation volume on that in that series. She says, by virtue of performing the sign at Cana, his hour begins. Jesus embarks on his journey to the cross. So there is awareness of that. And <coughs> we are now from the beginning of this gospel on a journey that will end with my hour. The hour is not yet here at the wedding and we will eventually <coughs> get there. <coughs> now standing there were six stone jars, six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. Notice <coughs> he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. It's water. So they took it. And here, <coughs> let's look at this one. This is of all the paintings of this scene. <coughs> I like this one the best because it really has huge stone jars. Yeah, look at this. Huge, each of them, 20 to 30 gallons. That those are big, big things. So we are dealing <coughs> on some <coughs> wine production almost on an industrial scale. <coughs> and we are, we are also <coughs> seeing some, some meanings here suggested. So I should not have, have uh, uh, written on that one, <coughs> but you will forgive me for doing that. So here, jars for purification. That's what we begin with, as, as if to reverse impurity, whatever impurities there might be, he will deal with it. And water turned into wine, replacing ordinary, that's water, with something that is extraordinary, that's wine. And then six jars and 30 gallons in each, transforming lack into abundance. <coughs> When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, it's an unbiased assessment, 
though the servants who had drawn the water knew. This is Johannine irony, you know. He, those guys don't know, those guys know. <coughs> so, and, of course, we as readers, we know. <coughs> the steward called <coughs> the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine, after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. So just a comment on, on the notion of getting drunk here, because that is not how people do it in the Middle East. There is a stigma to drunkenness. So this more is more being sated, being sort of filled up more than, than inebri inebriation. But that's, <coughs> that's a, a moot point. Uh, here again, so here we have uh, <coughs> the steward uh, who is tasting the wine and uh, uh, coming to conclude that it is of a very, <coughs> very high quality enough to make a further comment. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> quality and custom. Here is my list again of reversals. The reversal of impurity, reversal of ordinary, and the uh, magnitude or the amount, uh, quantity I should say. And here we have an uh, unbiased assessment of quality. It's very good quality. And we have a reversal of custom. The good wine is saved for last. And there is a logic to it. Of course, in life's experiences, we begin with good. We, we g begin with youth. And then we r sort of run it out. It, is, it ends. It gets depleted. Here, there is a reversal of depletion. The good wine is served last. <coughs> Jesus did this, <coughs> the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So these are big steps in the story, big accomplishments, and words that are really major words in the Gospel of John, such as signs, that's an important word, and glory, that's an important word, and believing in him is also important because that is one of the goals in the story. So let's just explain glory, because <coughs> that is maybe the most challenging term. Glory is related to a person's character and reputation. It is related to the opinion others hold of him or her. And in John, glory revealed is not only meant to enhance a good reputation, but to restore to that person glory that has been taken away. Some, somehow this person has been diminished. Somehow something has happened to the op opinion others hold of the person. And something happens by means of revelation to set the record straight or to set things right. And I had the same illustration here, so I don't need to comment on that again. <coughs> this is a detail from Duccio. Uh, depiction 14th century he was in the city of Siena uh, in Italy and has many very evocative depictions of uh, <coughs> scenes from the life of Jesus and <coughs> this is one of them but <coughs> we will do some questions where to begin if we were advising Jesus let's say that he wanted input from us how, where, and with what would we counsel him to begin? So he is on a mission, he's going to do something important, he's going to reveal God to the world. So let's ask, so let's say that we get to advise him how to start. And I would venture to say that few, if any, would advise him to begin this way. That doesn't seem uh, real, uh, uh, <coughs> right. And then I have evidence to prove the point that we would hardly have advised them to do that. 
This is David Friedrich Strauss, who wrote an extremely important book in the 19th century that made it just sensational in Germany. And later, in 1854, it was translated into English by George Eliot, <coughs> The Life of Christ Critically Examined. And this is a very <coughs> critical and in some ways very well written book <coughs> by someone who, in, to me, is a kind of know-it-all, which is not a very good thing to be. <coughs> but here is how he assesses the the what Jesus did at the at the at the wedding here, <coughs> so Jesus did not. He criticizes it. He finds finds it to be a strange thing. Jesus did not, as was usual for him with him, relieve any want, any real need, but only furnished an additional incitement to pleasure. Showed himself not so much helpful as courteous. Rather, so to speak, performed a miracle of luxury rather than of true beneficence. And here <coughs> I have the text in German. It is even, even greater and better in German. There was no knee. He, this is not a real need, a real sort of problem that you need to do and that he needed to do. It is what he calls a luxus wonder a miracle of luxury. And so he has found fault with Jesus on two, two uh, counts here. So <clears throat> what are they? First of all, he doesn't believe in miracles to begin with. So this is another way of sort of, uh, <clears throat> sort of downputting. There should not be miracles. So that's a physical objection that is throughout the book. Uh, his book here. <clears throat> and the second one is, there shouldn't be a miracle like this one. You know, well, if you do miracles, <clears throat> you know, get serious, do something that really meets a need, you know. And in some ways, it is his moral objection that counts the most here. We almost forget that he doesn't believe in miracles, but <clears throat> you shouldn't have miracles like this one. So Jesus is in trouble here. <clears throat> and and maybe we are too, or maybe we also feel a certain ambush by the priorities here. This was the first sign. This was done in Cana of Galilee. Jesus revealed his glory. His disciples believed in him. And the occasion is what he does here at the wedding. So <clears throat> let's see that there could be other ways. If a world looked like this, and it does look like this too. We might <coughs> say, as this person does, <coughs> they don't have shelter. Or we might say, they don't have food, because that is a need in the world, we know. Or we might say, they don't have water, because we know that there is a lack of water in the world, and that is the next big thing for the global community. Or we might say they don't have peace. We might just feature such big ticket items. And surely, if I were advising Jesus, I would tell him, <coughs> do, one, do something with one or two or three of those <coughs> items. That would be a good place to start. And then we hear his mother tell him, They don't have wine. It doesn't really add up, does it? It just doesn't seem like it. Maybe, maybe the <coughs> objection of David Friedrich Strauss has merit. You know, that this was a miracle of luxury, not a real need. You know, what to do with it? <coughs> but that's what we have to work with. <coughs> so do we have any resources that are helpful here? I have at least one. And this is Dostoevsky, who in many people's reckoning is, if not the foremost novelist in the world, surely one of them, surely way, way up there on, on anyone's shortlist. And this is his book, <coughs> The Brothers Karamazov, 
that was published. It was serialized in a magazine just before Dostoevsky died and finally published as a book in 1881. <coughs> and I put then a glass of wine in it because <coughs> Dostoevsky was sent off to prison in Siberia. I think that was in about 1849 or so. And people didn't expect to see him again. And a woman handed him a New Testament. And only four books are known to us from Dostoevsky's library. One of them is the New Testament. And the Gospel of John is heavily marked up. He was an avid reader of the New Testament, of the Gospel of John. He is highly biblically literate. That's what good literature will do. <laughs> good literature is biblically literate. And there isn't as much of that anymore. <clears throat> so in the book, telling the story of the brothers Karamazov, there is a scene of interaction between one of the brothers, his name is Alyosha, and Alyosha's mentor, who is an Orthodox priest by the name of Zosima. And Alyosha is planning to enter a priestly at church vocation. And <coughs> here, Zosima, the mentor, has died. Here, by the way, is a depiction of Zosima, and this is a scene from Russia, and it's simple 19th century uh, th thing. <coughs> so, we're going to read that statement. So, Alyosha remembers the teachings of his mentor Zosima. And Zosima had a view of the meaning of the, uh, the wa uh, water made into wine at the wedding. Not grief, but men's joy Christ visited when he worked his first miracle, he helped men's joy. He who loves men loves their joy. The dead man used to repeat it all the time. It was one of his main thoughts. This is what Alyosha will remember about his wedding. That when Jesus, uh, or about his mentor and about the wedding. So when Jesus did this, he had in mind to minister to people's joy, and that makes sense of it. And I actually think <coughs> that is not a bad interpretation. That is at least something to take us out of that thing that Jesus didn't, that this was a trivial, <coughs> trivial miracle, that he, uh, it was a miracle of luxury and not of real need. So <coughs> let's get over that and here is a depiction and I have a headline for it. <laughs> is he on a mission of grief relief? He is. Of course he is. Uh, he will raise people from the dead eventually. He will la raise Lazarus from the dead. Or is he an, on a mission of joy recovery? Is what is missing in the world, even if it was just the absence of joy, is that of interest? to God and to Jesus who comes to the world to reveal God. And it's also like this, that God is often called upon in situations of need. Where is God? God is more, is more infrequently or more rarely called upon in situations of happiness. No one misses God in those situations, or fewer people miss him if he has gone missing. So here Jesus is making his presence felt in an occasion, on an occasion of joy, even though here uh, joy is compromised by the absence of, of wine. <clears throat> there is an Old Testament antecedent for this to sort of factor it in to make sure we see this in a wider context of, of the Bible. <coughs> and uh, so prefigured in the Old Testament. <coughs> On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. 
And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, Revelation. The sheet that is spread over all nations, Revelation. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Do you see how these are mixed up? How the big needs, the grief, the tears, the death is also combined here. Relief on, in those realms is combined here with that feast where well-aged wines will be served. <coughs> so there is a context, an Old Testament context. <coughs> we have a few questions <coughs> to ask before we close off here. Uh, is there anything else? Anything else to explain the first sign? We have felt somewhat helped by Dostoevsky, by Alyosha, by Zosima. Anything else to connect the beginning and the ending? The wedding, maybe, and the cross? Or anything else to make the sign something other than a miracle of luxury? Uh, that doesn't seem quite right. <clears throat> so in the prologue in the Gospel of John, uh, descri describing the mission of the revealer, we read that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not defeat it. So we have light going head to head with darkness and wishing to overcome the darkness in the world. And then we read that the revealer became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory. There is that word again that was revealed at the wedding. The glory as of the Father's only Son, full of gift and truth. And <coughs> to put this in <coughs> a little perspective, let me just hint at something that I hope will become uh, more clear as we go through the story. How does the sign resonate if we take it to be a candle lit to reverse darkness? A candle, a light lit to reverse perceptions that something was thought that was wrong in some ways and the sign at the wedding begins a reversal. Here in the prologue we read about gift and truth gift and truth, had someone said that there was no gift to be had. And now there is one. And truth, had someone been lying, because truth is the counterpoint to untruth or to lies. So if we look at it in this way, we could see that Jesus is embarking on a reversal and the dimensions of that may not be totally clear to us yet, but I hope these are hints that can be used for something. <coughs> so, the first week, <coughs> just to walk us through it, uh, again, day one, day two, Jerusalem inquiry, pointing out the Lamb of God, first disciples on the third day, going to Galilee on the fourth day, then there is an interim day, uh, and then there is the wedding in Cana, sort of uh, <coughs> marking off the first week. So we have a handicap here, because we don't know which <coughs> day is day one. But this is a plausible reconstruction. And then <coughs> I would just walk us through very fast the Passion Week, the ending of the story in the Gospel of John that culminates with with the uh, crucifixion. <coughs> so, so here in the previous one, let's see here, <coughs> the culminating thing is the wedding in Cana. Water is made into wine. And here, <coughs> the culminating ev event is the crucifixion. And a sort of climactic scene in the crucifixion is the scene of blood and water that comes out from the side of Jesus. And here we know which day is day six. We know that this is day six. We know this is a Friday. And then I am saying that it is plausible, possible 
or even plausible that the first week mirrors the last week. And <coughs> if the first week mirrors the last week, then the sign at the wedding prefigures the cross and flavors the meaning of the cross. Those things, I think, should be in place already. And just to maybe get a little more explicit and on what to do, so here we have something to drink, of course. Lots of it, good quality, served in a state of need. When the mother says to him they don't have wine, well, now they do. And then as people or some people have perceived the climactic event of the last week, there is again something to drink. Those are, uh, in, in that sense, <coughs> moving from that scene at the beginning to another scene and Jesus saying it at the wedding, my hour has not yet come. Well, here it has come. Those are juxtapositions that might be uh, helpful. <coughs> Let's review what we have seen. <coughs> the first sign in review. They have no wine. At first sight, that's a lack that seems trivial. <laughs> but it isn't trivial in the fourth gospel. It is actually a diagnostic of the human condition seen from above, seen from the perspective of the gospel that is a serious lack. And <coughs> glory is related to the esteem in which a person is held. In John, the remedy for a person who has been misrepresented and misperceived. That's God. <coughs> And here, <coughs> Dostoevsky's Zosima was not wrong when he says that the revealer came to minister to human joy. It's not wrong. It's a good point. <coughs> when the hour comes, it will be the culmination and climax of the note struck at the wedding. Gift and truth writ large. This one I just learned from an article I read just last week. <coughs> the head waiter and the bridegroom at the wedding come across as insignificant fig figures. The head waiter doesn't know what is going on. He doesn't even seem to know that they had run out of wine. It's not the head waiter who comes and says we are running out of wine. And he doesn't know where the wine came from. <coughs> so he is in some ways a bit insignificant. And then and the bridegroom, <coughs> when the head waiter came, comes to the bridegroom and says, what have you done? The bridegroom is ignorant. He doesn't know what he, had happened either. He doesn't say a word. Prepare for the discovery that the mother is the head waiter and Jesus is the bridegroom. And that will become explicit in 329. When John the Baptist will say, it is he who has the bride, who, has to, who is the bridegroom. So these are, are threads woven into the story. Into, and then <coughs> the last one. A person has one chance to make a first impression. We say a person, you can only make a first impression once. When they see you the second and third time, it will no longer be the first impression. A person has one chance to make a first impression. On that score, Jesus used the first time well. <coughs>